Hello, everyone. I am Joe Morita, Senior Acquisitions Editor at Springer Publishing, and I am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is focused on leadership and innovation in nursing. Nursing contact hours for this webinar are being offered through The Ohio State University. Once you close the webinar browser at the end of the presentation, you will be redirected to a survey you can complete to receive CE credit. We will also include the survey link in a follow-up email. Today's webinar will be presented by Bernadette Melnick and Tim Ratterstorff of The Ohio State University. As most of you probably know, Bernadette Melnick is professor and dean of the College of Nursing at OSU, where she also serves as vice president for health promotion and university chief wellness officer. She is also professor of pediatrics and psychiatry at OSU's College of Medicine and executive director of the Helene Fold Health, health Trust National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice. Dr. Melnick is an international leader and innovator, and her area, areas of expertise include evidence-based practice, intervention research, child and adolescent mental health, and overall health and wellness. As principal investigator, she has received more than $33 million in research funding. She has edited seven books and produced more than 400 publications. Among countless other acc accolades, she is also elected fellow of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Nursing, the National Academies of Practice, and the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. Her co-presenter, Tim Rattersdorf, is Chief Innovation Officer at OSU's College of Nursing and is the first nurse to hold this academic title in the United States. Tim was named the 2018 Early Career Innovator of the Year at OSU for his work founding the Innovation Studio, which is an incubator that provides tools and mentorship to interprofessional healthcare teams. He serves on the American Nurses Association's Innovation Advisory Board and is founder of three annual innovation conferences. Byrne and Tim are co-authors of a new textbook, Evidence-Based Leadership, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship in Nursing and Healthcare, which will be published by Springer and be available in mid-November. We'll provide more information about the title later in the webinar. I'm pleased to present Byrne and Tim. Thank you, Joe. We are excited to be with all of you this afternoon. Never before, I believe, in our country, do we have a need to prepare nurses as leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs. We are going to be talking about why this trifecta is so necessary for today's nurses and talking about the adverse effects that we are experiencing because we are not producing a generation of nurses and other healthcare providers that have these characteristics of terrific leadership innovation and entrepreneurship thinking. And that's a great segue, Byrne, into our first slide where we're talking about that triad that, that of leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So can you talk to me a little bit about how leadership, innovation, entrepreneurship have been uh, core to your development and how they've helped you get you to the, the level of impact that you've been able to have through your work, your publications, and your businesses? Sure. So for one, I've always been a big dreamer. Sometimes we get very focused on detail and process, and we need to help nurses be more creative. They are creative. They are wonderful. But often they have not been supported to share those ideas, those innovations. We are also living in a world right now where costs are a main driver of everything healthcare does. It's also a driver in academia. Leaders need, and even if you're not a formal leader, because I always say, you don't need a title to lead. If we were able to prepare all of our students to possess great leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurial skills, we could so disrupt this healthcare system 
which is really needed because despite having the awesome thought power, the number of nursing schools, medical schools, pharmacy schools we have in this country, we honestly have poor healthcare rankings. And we're going to get into those rankings here in a minute, but I think one of the things I'd like to start with first is fear. So I'm not sure how the audience has reacted to this at the beginning, but we talked about in leadership, innovation, entrepreneurship. And, you know, when I go and speak across the country on these topics, I think there is this inherent fear of health professionals to embrace entrepreneurship, an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, without necessarily recognizing how ingrained that is in our culture. So um, I, I want to talk about innovation first and define that for you here. When, when Bern and I are, are speaking about innovation, we're defining that as the process of implementing new products, services, or solutions that create value. And value is really that key thread that we see throughout the innovation con, uh, continuum. And one of the things that we want you all to be focusing on as we talk about innovation in, in the broad sense today. And then I want to talk about um, core nursing personality traits. So uh, I'm sure many of you are, remember reading about Petroselli's 15 core personality traits in nursing school. Um, and if any of you actually nodded and said yes that you did, um, you, you need to rethink that because Joe Petroselli is actually my high school basketball coach. Uh, but if you look here at the 15 uh, core companies that, are, that are, are listed, these are actually Morris's modified entrepreneurial concepts. But if you think of it from a nursing perspective, all of these, and, and a healthcare provider perspective, all of these things are ingrained into what we do on a daily basis. When we assess opportunity, we manage the uncertainty, even as you go all the way down to the end of tenacity and pers perseverance and having resilience and reframing, because our patients not, don't always have the outcomes that we have, and we need to be able to persevere in our leadership as we move through our careers. So teaching people to be entrepreneurial doesn't mean that they have to go out and start businesses. It means that they can take an entrepreneurial mindset to the bedside, to their leadership, and engage and act as what we call an intrapreneur. So hopefully that, that quells some anxiety that you may have about these terms, innovation and entrepreneurship, because really what we're talking about here is value and impact. And we really want you all to be able to understand and engage how you can bring those things um, to the bedside or to your students or to whoever you are impacting in healthcare. And that entrepreneurial mindset is the thread throughout, whether you're in the leadership position, the innovation position, or an academic position, engaging others, creating value, and learning from intentional iteration. And intentional iteration means that you're trying things again, you're having that willingness to fail, but always persevering and moving forward with your leadership. And one of the key components of this entrepreneurial mindset that we're going to kind of use to dissect our talk today is the problem solution statement. And one of my favorite entrepreneurial sayings is fall in love with the problem, not the solution, because the solutions are always going to change. And the problems are really the things that you're trying to tackle. So you need to be able to really understand your problem and push your way towards a solution that addresses it. And knowing that that first idea, your first thoughts of what can solve it, probably need to be iterated on many times to be able to effectively solve the problem. So, Byrne, let's talk about the state of healthcare. What does healthcare look like for our clinicians? For uh, but but first, even before clinicians, let's talk about it in America and what we're seeing with our patients and our population. Absolutely, as I mentioned before, something is wrong with this equation. We spend more money on health care than any Western world country, but we rank 37th in health outcomes. Not only that, 700 women die every single year in childbirth. 700 women. We are the worst country, Western world country, to give birth in. One of the reasons that happens is because even though we produce all this fabulous research evidence every single year, people aren't following research-based guidelines. We still have so much opportunity to have the evidence-based practice be in the DNA of every clinician. 
And then let's take a look at chronic disease. One out of two people in this country have a chronic disease, yet 80% of chronic disease is totally preventable with just a few healthy lifestyle behaviors. But sadly, we still live in such a sick care healthcare system. We absolutely need to turn sick care into well care. Even if somebody is at the end of their lives, they should be assisted to achieve their optimal state of well being. The World Health Organization says by 2030, depression will be the second most impairing disease worldwide. What we need to realize is one out of four people have multiple chronic conditions. The comorbid condition is usually depression or anxiety. So if we're not preparing our folks to tackle preventatively and early evidence-based interventions for depression and anxiety, we don't stand a chance of getting people better physically. Then take a look at our suicide rate. Suicide is the second leading cause of death now in 10 to 34-year-olds. You know, Tim, Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But we continue in our curricula to teach very, very rare diseases and processes instead of focus more on key leadership skills to move the healthcare system to more of prevention than sick care. If you ask me today, what's the number one killer of Americans? I'd have to tell you that it is cardiac disease. However, if we take into consideration all causes of death and disease in the United States, it's our behaviors that are the number one killer physical inactivity, unhealthy eating. Look at the opioid epidemic we have in the United States. And also, I'm so serious about being aware of your chair. We know if we sit three hours a day, it increases our risk of cardiac disease by 30%. If we sit five hours a day, that's comparable to smoking one and a quarter packs of cigarettes on our body every day. I'm hoping those of you on the webinar just stood up when you heard that evidence. But sincerely, everybody, we can spew fact after fact after evidence after evidence, but that doesn't change people's behaviors. And if we are truly going to reduce the risk of chronic disease in this country, we must be placing more emphasis on prevention, early intervention, motivational interviewing, teaching our students how to write scripts for physical activity, stress reduction, healthy eating. I'm not saying medication isn't indicated. But do you know how impactful it is to get a prescription for 30 minutes of physical activity? It's powerful, but yet we're not doing that throughout the country. So, Bern, we talk about all these behavioral components that we are doing that have a negative impact on our lives. What are the things that we can do that are evidence-based and that will allow us to 
have healthier lives ourselves and to help lead other people have healthier lives as we work on our leadership core competencies. I want to preface this too um, by saying not a lot of leadership courses and textbooks get into self-care. Self-care is so critical. If we don't take good self-care, how can we take great care of other people? So I have an evidence-based recipe on how to cut chronic disease substantially. We would have 66% less diabetes, 45% less heart disease, 45% less back pain, 93% less stress if everybody just did 30 minutes, five days a week of physical activity, ate five fruits and vegetables per day. By the way, the average American eats two. Don't smoke and don't drink alcohol. But if you drink, limit your alcohol intake to one drink a day if you're a woman, two a day if you're a man. And everybody asks me, Burn, how big can that drink be? I tell everybody, not the size of the alcoholic beverages you get in Vegas. But to illustrate my point further, there was a Gallup poll study done which actually showed nurses have higher rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression than physicians. So our team conducted a study that we published last year in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. We surveyed nearly 3,000 nurses from 19 healthcare systems across the United States, but we pulled out just the practicing nurses, which were about 1,900. What we found in that study is about half of those nurses reported poor physical or mental health. Nurses in poor physical or mental health made significantly more medical errors. And then, by the way, we showed what several other studies show. The longer the shift hours that they worked, the more medical errors that were made. Now, we've got a strong body of evidence that says stop 12-hour shifts. But we continue to do them. Why? A lot of chief nurses have said to me, because our nurses will whine. My response to that is, if your child wanted to jump off a bridge, would you let him or her do that? We've got to prepare leaders that make decisions based on best evidence. And we've got to translate our evidence much more quickly than the 17, 20, or 30 years it takes now. And we need leaders who use evidence, but when evidence doesn't exist, they have got to be innovators and they've got to think entrepreneurially. I don't know if all of you were aware, but Burnout is affecting about 52% of nurses, doctors, pharmacists, and other clinicians. Two years ago, the National Academy of Medicine said burnout, depression, and suicide is a public health epidemic, and we've got to do something about it. So they launched the Action Collaborative on Clinician Well-Being and Resilience. I'm blessed to serve as one of 60-some leaders throughout the country that are working on this Action Collaborative. We have a healthcare system right now that is really contributing to this burnout, 
this depression and this problem we are seeing. So again, we need leaders who can work on systems change for the safety, for the welfare of our population health outcomes. But we also need clinicians who will, and leaders who will prioritize, learn how to prioritize their own self-care. When we get on a flight, we are told if the flight decompresses and oxygen mass drop, we need to put the oxygen mass on ourselves first before we put them on others. We as leaders, as faculty, as clinicians, we got to prioritize our own self-care because if we don't, our families are going to suffer because we might not be around as long as we would like to be. So, Bern, we've talked about self-care being a key aspect of leadership, uh, which I think is a, a new approach as we, we look to creating the future, the, the leader or the future leaders of tomorrow. Um, there, there's many other problems at hand, but I think the one we want to discuss next is the integration or lack of integration of evidence-based practice. One of my favorite sayings that you provide, and I'm not going to steal your thunder here, but it is in God we trust, and there's more to it here. So talk to us about the saying and, uh, and where it lies and how this impacts us as leaders at the bedside or within our organization. Right. So some of you might recall our team published a study of chief nurses throughout the United States. And we were pretty disheartened when we saw the findings. Their top priorities, as I would expect, were quality and safety. But evidence-based practice fell to the bottom of their priority list. So that told us there is a severe disconnect between them wanting quality and safety and not realizing evidence-based practice is the direct pathway to get their healthcare system to achieve what we now call the quadruple aim in the healthcare. We, by preparing our nurses to be leaders, innovators, entrepreneurs, as well as to use evidence-based decision-making in everything they do will get us to the quadruple aim. So the Institute for Healthcare Improvement several years ago put the triple aim out there. And that was all about improving the patient experience, which gets to quality and safety improving population health outcomes, lowering costs. Everybody has to develop entrepreneurial thinking to be able to lower costs in academia and in our healthcare systems. And that goes for your clinicians at the bedside who can be fabulous leaders and who can disrupt the healthcare system for the better. But the last aim is really to improve clinician well being. And that's where the NAM initiative comes into play. Because if we have leaders who have all of these skills, but yet they don't take good self care. They're going to be burnt out. We are never going to reach the quadruple aim in healthcare. So that brings us to as we as we transition into the solution phase. We didn't even talk about half of the problems about our GDP spending, about um, us the clinicians contributing to the number three cause of death in America, which are unintended medical errors. 
there are so many problems in healthcare that need an innovative and entrepreneurial and a new leadership approach to being solved. But now that we've talked about some of the problems, we're going to give you a couple of examples of how you could potentially work to solve them within your own organization. The first is something that we've already addressed and that's buying into an entrepreneurial mindset. It's teaching people that entrepreneurship is not a word about greed or money, but it's a word about leadership and about effectively utilizing the resources that are available within your organization and by being able to be nimble and not stay in your ruts and in your silos as you go out and you engage in leadership. One of the other core components of being an entrepreneur is networking. And that's one thing that I believe we as healthcare leaders need to step up our game on quite exponentially. This ability to network and leverage each other's minds or each other's experiences, shared commonalities, and, uh, and, and really be able to learn from the mistakes that have been made across the organization instead of hiding those within our own silos is a concept that has not been widely accepted across healthcare yet, but is a concept that has proven to be incredibly effective in the entrepreneurial world. So it's another opportunity we have as leaders to expose our transparency and better learn from each other as we find our successes and our failures. Bern, one of my favorite things that you've worked on is this, uh, this innovation-based practice continuum. You know, you're, you're the world-class expert in evidence-based practice, but there's not always evidence for the things that we need, for the solution, for the problems at hand. We don't always have, um, we don't always have solutions that are gonna be able to be filled or be backed by evidence. So let's talk about innovation filling the gap when it comes to innovation-based practice. You bet. So evidence-based practice is a problem-solving approach to the way we deliver healthcare. We, are, we integrate the best evidence from well-designed studies, combine them with our clinician expertise and patients' preferences and values. But as we all know, there are several areas out there for practice where we don't have high quality evidence. So when that evidence does not exist to support a change in practice, innovative solutions must be generated to address problems to ultimately improve healthcare quality and patient outcomes. So innovation-based practice occurs at the intersection of what is known based on evidence and what is needed or desired. But in order for an innovation to stick, to sustain, you then go together evidence behind it. And that's where we depend on our wonderful PhD researchers to generate that evidence. And our DNPs, who are experts in evidence-based practice, to work on translating rapidly that evidence into practice to improve care outcomes and costs. And one of the things I want to hit on here with this innovation-based practice is that at times it, it is the researcher, it is the DNP, but a lot of times we know that the person who understands the problem the best is typically the person at the front line. And it's that bedside clinician who's able to really articulate the true problems that exist in healthcare. We're going to talk very briefly here about a solution that we've integrated at Ohio State to empower those people at the front lines to build a structure of innovation and really incentivize them to engage in the behaviors that we think are necessary to change the future of healthcare. But first, as a leader, one of the key solutions that we talk about is knowing yourself. Bern, how has knowing yourself impacted you as a leader and what are the lessons that you've learned about yourself that have helped you achieve such success? Well, there aren't a lot of leadership books out there right now that really help participants or learners to to really do a good self-assessment, to see their strengths as well as their limitations. And we really focus a lot on that uh, at the beginning of our book because you've got to become self-aware as a leader. And that's a process. 
And we all are going to make mistakes, but hopefully we will learn from those mistakes and move on, take the wise lessons we've learned from those mistakes to move on. But you've got to know yourself as a leader before you can build other strengths in other leaders. And those are really important concepts that don't tend to get covered in typical leadership courses that Tim and I really believe are so necessary. So you're going to see things in this new book that you aren't going to find in any other book. For instance, I tell my own journey of leadership, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the form of a story. And Tim's going to talk more about, again, how we've tried to differentiate this book to be relatable and to be written in a way that's really super engaging for learners. When we talk about return on investment and value on investment from a leadership perspective, um, there, there's a lot of things to consider there, Byrne. And financial indicators tend to be the thing that, that kind of blends across the two. But can you talk about from a leadership solution when it comes to uh, innovation, innovation leadership and entrepreneurial leadership, how return on investment and value on investment need to be key considerations for, for leaders? I think every clinician and leader needs to think about so what outcomes and how to transfer those outcomes to costs as well as value of investment. Vern, can I jump in right there? You said so what outcomes, and this is actually one of the things that attract, what was so attractive to me coming to work with you was because you understood the impact and the power of so what outcomes, but I'm not sure our audience actually knows what that means. So can you really quickly talk about so what outcomes and maybe give your example that you give of your COPE research of really how that shifted um, the way that it got integrated and, and had a massive impact? across the country. Right. So those of us that do research a lot of times, we measure what I call warm and fuzzy outcomes. That I hate to say it, but this is the truth that the healthcare system really doesn't care about. And we're not including enough hard, what I've labeled so what outcomes into making an argument for why we should make a practice change. Um, not until I showed cost outcomes, reductions in length of stay, in rehospitalization rates, did the healthcare systems care about implementing my evidence-based program with parents in their preterm infants. Clinicians also, again, if they're making an argument or a chief nurse is making an argument and they go to their CEO and they say, I need 150 or $200,000 to make a practice change to reduce maternal infant bonding in our hospital. That CEO is going to look at that chief nurse like they have two heads. Not that maternal infant bonding isn't important. Goodness knows as a pediatric nurse practitioner, I know how important maternal infant bonding is. But if that chief nurse went to that CEO and said, I need $200,000 to decrease rehospitalization rates by making this practice change, and the resultant outcome will mean $3 million of savings to our healthcare system. Again, that CEO is going to be excited about the $3 million in savings. So, whether we like it or not, we have to bring up our nurse leaders to really know how to think like an entrepreneur. And as Tim, you stated, 
when we say entrepreneurial thinking, we're not saying everybody should go out and start their own businesses, although a lot of nurses should because they have wonderful, innovative ideas that'll fill a gap, but they're afraid to risk take. And again, this is something risk taking, dreaming big, risk taking needs to be taught as core principles for the next generation of nurse leaders. So, Byrne, one of your favorite sayings is culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I absolutely agree with this, with, with this um, statement. But as we've worked on what we're going to talk about next is our innovation studio, we've understood that the importance in the, of the structure of innovation and how that impacts your culture or drives your culture. So what I, my, my follow-up is if culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then structure eats culture for dessert. And we're going to talk about the impact of structure of innovation here through the innovation studio. So this is one of the, the largest projects that Byrne and I have taken in the realm of innovation at Ohio State, where we've actually developed a physical maker space that travels to different locations across campus. You can see it here. It's filled with 3D printers and laser cutters, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, and a bunch of other things that sound crazy and fun, because they are. They are crazy and fun, and they empower our clinicians to try new things, to tinker, and to engage in creating the solutions of the future. Uh, the Innovation Studio, we were for very fortunate to receive a, a large gift um, from our, uh, some of our alumni. Uh, and, and we originally thought that their money, that, that their donation was going to be able to help us run the studio for three years. Uh, but what we're finding is that this actually hasn't been nearly as expensive as we originally had, had, um, had envisioned. But what the studio does is we set up our, our shop, this, the shop here, in high traffic locations across campus. So this picture is in front in the lobby of our cancer hospital. Uh, and we stay there for seven weeks at a time. And we sit outside the front door and encourage people to come in to engage. We give them the permission to innovate and the validation to innovate. And those are two core competencies of leadership that are often left out when it comes to innovation. That people assume that putting innovation or entrepreneurial thinking in your mission is enough to get people to engage. But the core component of that, of that leadership is actually provide explicitly providing the permission and explicitly stating that you believe in your team and their ideas and you want them to pursue them regardless of the end outcome. So we do that through our studio. We have a pitch day at the end of each one of those tour stops and teams come in. They have to be interprofessional. So it can't be just two nurses or it can't be two docs. They have to uh, cross pollinate and, and get a, a variety of ideas and backgrounds behind their team. And then they pitch their idea to us. And the thing that we do that's incredibly unique that, that we're, we believe that no one else is doing right now in the world is that we fund every single team. Every team gets a yes from us when they walk through that door for their first pitch. And we believe in the power behind that, that it provides inspirational capital and it provides the validation to innovate. So you may be thinking, wow, that has to be incredibly expensive. Uh, but one of our greatest success stories is led by two nurses here uh, who wanted to keep patients who are addicted to opioids safer in the health system. You know, when, when patients who are addicted to opioids show up in a hospital and they get an IV, we've just done something incredibly terrifying for them. And that's give them direct access to their channel of, for their drug of choice. But Sheila and Karen found a way to keep patients safe by adding a tamper evident tape that goes over the ports of every IV line uh, that they have in that, um, that they have for, their, for the lines. So therefore we're able to see if patients are attempting to access their lines by the tamper evidence and we're able to intervene with them and provide them additional support if they find themselves struggling with their addiction while they're in the health system. Karen pitched this to us in October of 2017 by, then she came back to the innovation studio three more times to get additional rounds of funding from us. She spent two to three nights a week in the innovation studio learning how to make things with our laser cutter, which is what she's opening up here. She developed multiple prototypes and by July of 2018, just nine months later, she had signed an international licensing deal with one of the top distributors of healthcare tape in America. Here's the thing. We talked about you, you worrying about the expense behind this project. In total, we spent $240.20 to get Karen's idea off the ground. So innovation does not have to be expensive. And that, yes, there certainly are cases when that's, where that is true. But 
when you have the right people and you have the right ideas and people who understand the simplicity of problem solving at the bedside, you're really able to leverage that power and see these ideas come to life. So this is just one of many ways that you can encourage innovation and an entrepreneurial mindset within your organization. And for those of you who are still concerned with the capital component, here's some other great idea, other ways to incentivize entrepreneurship within your organization. Um, there's idea fairs, hackathons, a fund that you can create that gives people access to these things. If you do that, though, I encourage you not to give away large sums of money. I encourage you to give away incredibly small sums of money to people to provide that validation and the buy-in. And then there's the famous innovation time that Google has at their organization where they allow people one day a week to work on any project that increases their interest. So focusing on things that are, you're passionate about really brings out that innovative and, uh, and entrepreneurial opportunity. And surely you can't do that for nurses at the bedside, but perhaps you can build that into lunch breaks or other fun ways to get people engaged in innovation. So I believe it's so critical to instill in all of our nurses how to dream big. Nothing happens unless first a dream. And that might sound funny or fuzzy to a lot of you. However, I have, I have read so many biographies of successful people. They don't talk about the details of how they got from point A to point B. They talk about how they woke up every morning and put the dream in front of them. So I'm well known for asking this question and I'm gonna ask it again during this webinar. If I could be your fairy godmother and give you any dream or wish that you could accomplish in the next five to 10 years, what would you do if you know you could not fail? And then risk take. That's what discovery is all about. Discovery is about innovating and going out and taking risks and then executing until your dreams are truly delivered. And again, we have to cultivate a new group of nurse leaders who do dream big, discover, take those risks, and persist through the character builders until their dreams come to fruition. So I'll be honest with you, Bern, um, it wasn't a dream of mine to author a textbook. <laughs> it, it was one of those things that always seemed uh, very challenging to me. Uh, but uh, for those of you who saw my, my LinkedIn post, um, I, I also never wanted to be in a profession where a third of my colleagues leave within two years of starting the field. I never wanted to contribute to the number three leading cause of death. Uh, but eventually you end up getting to a point where uh, new dreams occur for impact. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled and more excited with this book as it really um, integrates our passions for healthcare leadership in a way that I think um, is new, exciting and refreshing to uh, academics and practitioners alike. One of the core components that you, you alluded to earlier on was that storytelling is a theme throughout. So my chapter two of the book talks about your journey to and through entrepreneurship and innovation and leadership. Um, and it's written in the first person, an incredibly compelling story for those of you who, who know Burns' background. Um, but it's not just in, in Burns' uh, chapters that it happens. We have about eight or nine chapters that are written in the first person that engage storytelling and actually thread the content of the book throughout. We wanted this book to read more like a good piece of nonfiction than a textbook. Um, so that is going to be different and I, I want you all to be aware of that, but we see that as such a value add for this new era of students who are coming in and are looking for new methods of learning. Storytelling is a key component that has been around since the beginning of, of verbal communication. And it's something that I think we can do a better job as educators. And this book has really integrated that into it, in, into practice. Another thing that we have is, and that we've harped on quite a bit today already is the innovation and entrepreneurial mindset as core healthcare leadership traits. So it's not just talking about innovation and, and entrepreneurship and how they can be done, but bringing that back to the leader and empowering the leader to provide that permission to innovate and that validation to innovate 
at every step of their leadership journey, whether that be while they're informal leaders at the bedside or formal leaders in the C-suite. There's a continuum of opportunity to be able to integrate these innovation and entrepreneurial concepts into leadership skills, and that's highlighted throughout the book. Another unique component of it is the call to action. Vern, why don't you tell people about the call to action and why we think this is such an important component of the book and why we didn't put in discussion questions at the end, but rather put the onus back on the reader to go out and put these, practice, these principles into practice. We all know that behavior change doesn't happen easily. Most people don't change behavior unless crisis happens or their emotions are raised. Education alone can raise awareness, but it also doesn't precipitate behavior change. We really want learners to engage and to put into practice the content they are learning in this book. This book is I, I'm biased, of course, because Tim and I wrote this book. Me too. Me but, too. But we are so excited about this because it's written so unlike other books on leadership and innovation. It has the entrepreneurial thinking in it, design thinking in it. These are all characteristics that are so needed. And throughout each um, chapter in this book, there are calls to action. We want students to put this relatable content that they're reading about into practice because that is the way they are going to develop these essential leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurial skills. And these are almost seen like assignments, but we're actually calling people to get out into their communities as well. So this is something that I do personally with my Masters of Healthcare Innovation program at Ohio State, where we have people go out and interview key stakeholders within their organization as assignments. And instead of writing papers, they're meeting the people who are making the key decisions about their future. And we find that to be so much more impactful than, than writing a paper or developing a mind map. So we really encourage you all to be engaging in, in, in if you adopt this, deck, this book, to really put those call to actions into practice and have that be the core opportunity for your students' growth. The other key thing that we do in this book is that we have brought in people who have walked the walk. So it, while Bern and I have our own uh, businesses on the side, they're certainly not to the scale of the gentleman you see in front of you here, who's Gary Sharp. He owns a company called Healthcare Logistics, um, and he writes a very compelling story on uh, his journey of starting this company with his wife and uh, keeping it as a family-owned business and creating the culture that he wanted to throughout the longevity of this company that's now been around for over 40 years uh, and is an international distributor of healthcare products. There's many other examples of practitioners writing chapters about how to be a practitioner entrepreneurial and have an entrepreneurial mindset as a practitioner. We also have uh, experts in social media who've written a chapter about social media and leadership and how you can uh, develop your own personal brand as you continue to be a leader. So many key things that we're hearing not just from um, faculty that they want to be able to teach, but we're hearing that expectation of leadership from our students and that these are the key things that they need to be successful as they move forward. So with that, Bern and I really would, would love to thank you for spending an hour of your time with us today. Um, this is really a, a true pleasure for us to be able to share our excitement and our expertise with you all, and we hope that that's going to lead to an impactful behavioral change on your end as you look to create the future of leaders. To request a copy of our book, you can email textbook at springerpub.com. That's textbook at springerpub.com. And we would love to hear from you. If you do get a chance to get a desk copy and have insights or questions about the book, you can find Bern and my contact information here. Bern is, is killing it on Twitter. If you don't follow her on Twitter, I highly recommend that you do that. She puts out great posts that not only uh, will inspire you, but will actually put your uh, call you to action and, and engage in healthy behaviors and, and great leadership capabilities. Myself, I'm more of a LinkedIn poster. Um, so uh, I would love for you to find me on LinkedIn and we can have some conversations about your innovation leadership and your entrepreneurial mindset and how we can continue to build upon that.
And then finally, to obtain CEs for this webinar, you need to complete the survey at go.osu.edu slash teaching innovation. That's go.osu.edu slash teaching innovation. We're going to leave this slide up for the Q&A session that we're going through today. So feel free to take a screenshot, write that down, uh, but you'll be able to see this URL um, for the continuing education components as we open it up for, for, for some questions from the audience. Tim, I don't know if you saw, but there are some questions that were posed throughout the presentation. Do you see those? Do you want me to read that? Uh, if you wouldn't mind reading them to me, Joe, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, sure. The first one is from Kelly Robke. Kelly, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Uh, the question is, the linkages between leadership and innovation are rather straightforward. Can you talk about innovation and entrepreneurship? Should we be cultivating each or both as skill sets? Perhaps this is the concept of entrepreneurship mentioned by Tim. Absolutely. Yeah, you're spot on with that. So again, if you think about a startup company um, or a company that's just getting off the ground, it usually begins with one or two people. And then they are responsible for creating the entire culture and building a business. So one of the key components of, of entrepreneurship that actually entrepreneurs overlook is the creating of the business entity, the culture, the, the structure, the things that actually impact how people feel when they come to work today. A lot of times, the first couple of people come in and they focus on the technology or whatever service it is that they're bringing forward. So as a leader, you need to understand the whole breadth of what it means to have that entrepreneurial uh, mindset and, and really, um, really engage in those 15 competencies that we discussed that so well align with the nursing process and the healthcare process that we're all very familiar with. Um, so that, that, that can be done through entrepreneurship, but for the majority of, of, of all leaders in healthcare, that's going to be in the, the concept of entrepreneurship that we mentioned, where you take those entrepreneurial principles and bring them into a larger, um, a larger organization and serve as an entrepreneur. Okay, and this question is also from Kelly. And I think I should also mention, <laughs> if anybody else has questions, you know, feel free to ask them and we'll cover as many as we can. Um, again, from Kelly, there are many risks to innovation in the adoption and acceptance phases, such as overcoming the status quo, as well as readily accepting innovation that may not have been well validated or lacks robust evidence. What are your thoughts on addressing these barriers to innovation? So oh, I'm going to jump in with this one. Um, there are barriers abound in healthcare, whether they're, whether they're present in innovation or whether they're present in evidence-based practice. Um, so the, that persistence and that perseverance tends to be a key component. But I wanna bring it back to what Byrne talked about with so what outcomes. Because uh, what we have found in innovation is that data talks and if you're able to showcase the potential impact of your, of your, your innovation, uh, even if there, there isn't data that exists for what it is today, if you're able to make projections, that's going to get you closer to being able to get the yes. Um, I, I can't tell you that that's going to work every time because the key decision sta or the stakeholders who are the key decision makers within each organization look for different parameters before making decisions. So really knowing your audience and knowing what those key leaders are looking for and then developing your so what outcomes so that they address them. Uh, that are address those that are unique to this to the stakeholders that is what we believe is one of the key parameters to success within the organization but may go ahead burn yeah i also think a key piece to all of this is i identifying where those problems are you know what are people really struggling with today what doesn't exist and then innovating that thinking about it and also bringing in that entrepreneurial mindset because so much anymore today is cost driven. I just picked up an article in Journal of Professional Nursing that's talking about economic trends in the higher education and how budgets are really being slashed. So whether you are truly a CEO of a large healthcare system, any kind of leader today needs this trifecta of skills. It's absolutely imperative. 
Thanks, Bern. Okay, before I get to the next question, I just th there's a few people asking about, they wanna look at a recording of this um, presentation and also we're asking about um, the textbook. We're gonna follow up with an email that will have a link to the, the presentation and you will also be able to order, um, get a copy of the textbook that way as well. So we'll have follow up that you guys can, can see. Um, when you close the webinar, you should get a pop-up of, um, of a survey that'll lead you to the CE credits. Okay, the, the next question is from Sonia Franklin. Um, would love some discussion on how to get funding. This is where I am struggling. Great question, Sonia, and a, an epic struggle that, that really gets to the heart of entrepreneurship. Uh, being able to get someone to buy in your dream is one of the key components of any entrepreneurial journey and any innovators or entrepreneurial journey. So um, what we have found is, is actually one of the core threads that we have throughout the book, and it's the power of storytelling. So we receive funding through our innovation studio, through finding people who wanted to have impact in a specific specialized way at Ohio State, and that was through innovation. And then we were able to identify what we thought would not only be the most impactful method to engage nurses, but we knew that the, the couple that was going to uh, fund this project had a passion for increasing or improving innovation across campus. So we've, we developed and designed our innovation studio to be interprofessional in nature to make sure that people, students from geography or nursing or pharmacy could all come together and engage. So it's really about figuring out who your potential audience may be and then tailoring your solution and your impact to their desires. Byrne, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I just have to put a plug in. We have a very different master's program here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Master of the Healthcare Innovation Program, where we really do teach people this trifecta of skills. But we've also launched an online certificate. Both of these uh, programs are available online. But if you really want to get steeped more in this whole innovation, entrepreneurship, design thinking, I'd encourage you to look at that online certificate program. Two questions from, I've got two questions from Susan. First one is, will the speakers share share the specs about their innovation center for those interested in developing their own site. Yeah, so um, the, the innovation studio, actually the easiest way to do this right now for sake of time is for you to go to go.osu.edu slash innovation studio. That is where you're going to be able to find um, information about the innovation studio and um, you can reach out to me directly. We're actually in talks with four different centers right now about potentially franchising the studio and helping organizations develop this within their own space so that we can have a cohort of innovation studios that are impacting healthcare across the world. So Susan, we'd love to have a conversation with you and, and give you some more specs about that. Um, when it comes to the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship, I, I think it's very easy to get those two combined, uh, but there, there's very different approaches to it. So uh, when we think of innovation, innovation follows the, the continuum of creating new value for an organization. Um, there's innovative approaches, there's innovation itself, there's a noun, there's a verb, and there's actually a lot of confusion behind, behind what it is. Um, but when it comes to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is the task or the, um, taking ownership for making that changes and creating value within your organization or externally for your new company. Um, so not all innovation is um, entrepreneurial, but I would say that you could probably say that all entrepreneurship is innovation. Okay, Tim, and I think it's one more question here, and I think it's a good one. Uh, I teach leadership and management at the BSN level. Do you have suggestions on introducing entrepreneurship to students who do not have a lot of expo exposure to practice problems or should it be addressed at all this early in, on in nursing education? It needs to be addressed right as students walk in the door. Think about it. I had mentioned behavior change takes time, but if we set up our students right from the beginning, 
these are expectations. You are going to be so excited because we're going to teach you not only how to be leaders, but innovators with an entrepreneurial mindset. It's like anything else. We have to, if we're going to instill these skills in our students, it has to begin from the start. These are skills that form the foundation of the future nurse that's going to disrupt healthcare in a big way for the better. Um, here, this is from Miguel. Does an innovative idea need to have a financial gain? Can the innovator entrepreneur idea just be beneficial for local community? Yeah, absolutely. It comes down to the value creation. So when you're that that value creation can be, it, it probably needs to be a so what outcome. So something that is going to create new value, but that doesn't mean that it has to be monetary. It can be increased provider satisfaction. There's there's many things that you can do, and it can be at that macro level. Changing the world for an n of one is certainly still changing the world. Okay, and I think we'll make this the last one from Christine Mihan. What role does the ANA and our credentialing organizations have to support innovation education and mindset? It will be hard to change nursing education until it is required educational information, which is assessed on the NCLEX exam. What do you think it will take? Oh, I think we're having some issues. So um, I, I, can, I can try and take this one. Christine, it's a great question. I think it's gonna take more innovation leadership from from us in academia to start calling for and demanding that these are integrated into higher education and that the, we see these as, as core leadership principles. I certainly take on that role when I sit on ANA's innovation board, uh, but I think we need to go beyond, um, beyond those boards and really figure out how we can collectively come together to make innovation and entrepreneurial mindset a core competency for our nurses. Um, and I, I think we can work on that also as we move up into the DNP essentials and our master's level essentials to start having that level of impact there. Okay, Bernard Tim, I'd like to thank you very much and um, I'd especially like to thank all the participants for being a part of this great hour. Much appreciated. Many thanks everyone, be curious. <laughs>